All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna to talk today about AI in the cloud. Um, of course, I'm with Google, uh, that's what I know best, but I think that uh, you're gonna hear about all the different ways that you can leverage cloud services, uh, whether that's through APIs, all the way to custom model development and everywhere in between with AutoML. Um, so whether you're an experienced data scientist or you're a developer who's looking at uh, bringing some uh, machine learning into your applications, I hope there's something helpful for you today. And we're gonna do a couple hands-on demos as well so that you can see some of these uh, tools in action. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of information about the right use case for machine learning. Uh, Let's then cover APIs. We'll move on to how to build your own custom model and then finally AutoML. So first, the right use case. Uh, and the reason I start with this is that um, machine learning is, you know, of course we all know there's a lot of promise. There's also some hype. It's useful to know where can you get a lot of value out of machine learning applications. So let's talk about a few clusters of use cases that we find for machine learning. One is predictive analytics, and that is looking at historical data and trying to make predictions and recommendations for the future. So that could be, you see some examples here, fraud detection, looking at a past transactions and using that information to look at a new transaction and make a determination on that one. Preventative maintenance, that's another common use case with industrial equipment, uh, looking at sensors and other uh, ways that we collect information. Can we prevent a catastrophic failure before it happens. Um, and a couple others here I'll mention quickly, uh, demand forecasting. So we might look at sales of different products or at different stores, and can we look at uh, you know, what might happen next month or next quarter so that we can make better decisions. Another area is unstructured data. So uh, maybe videos, images, uh, text data, and making some sense of those, triaging those and clustering that information. Automation is another common use case where we look at a step of a workflow that might be error prone or tedious and how can we use machine learning to uh, act on the data and make a good recommendation and uh, automate part of a process. And you see a few examples here from uh, maybe, uh, you know, form filling is a very common use case now where we have uh, paper documents that we can now, um, you know, digitize easily. Uh, another area is triaging information. So maybe we have a trouble ticket, a customer inquiry, and we can figure out which customer service agent might be best for that uh, issue based on what's in the text. Uh, just a few examples of things you could do. Finally, personalization. So how can we get to know our customer better and uh, tailor our experience with the data that we have. Okay, so when we're talking about the tools, uh, now that we've discussed use cases, there, the essence of this presentation is that there's a spectrum of possibilities. On one uh, hand, we can work uh, at the lower level at the machine learning infrastructure level. At the other hand, we can talk about APIs that don't require you bringing your own data or building a model where you're leveraging an existing model and simply passing in information and getting some outputs out of it. And then in the middle, uh, the idea of a platform of tools um, to uh, create, a, uh, create a model, deploy a model, test, et cetera, and then AutoML, which can help automate some of those steps. So let's start first with pre-trained models with APIs. So here are a few examples of capabilities ranging from vision to natural language, translation, et cetera. These allow you to accomplish common machine learning tasks. Let's start with the natural language API. So let's actually do a demo so that this makes it a little bit more fun. Um, I'm going to go to the cloud, google.com slash natural language site and just, just for fun, I've put in um, into this web demo uh, information from the conference. I just went to you know the, uh, some information about uh, what's great about the conference and plug that in here and uh, submitted it. 
and, and really what's happening, this is a web demo that is calling the API under the hood. And let's look at the information that we get back. So there's four categories uh, that you see here. The first is entity extraction. And this is where we take text and we figure out what are the main objects or concepts in the text. And what comes back is a ranked list of these items with this salient score, which tells you how central is that item to the meaning of the document. And then you see that various uh, words here are tagged, wh whether they're a person, a location, et cetera. That's entity extraction. Sentiment analysis is where we get a feeling about the document ranging from one positive to negative one uh, negative. Um, and you can see, let's just look at um, some of the sentences. So we see the overall document was 0.4, so positive. And then we can see at an individual paragraph level, and you know, we see, okay, we can set up a dynamic registration. Okay, slightly positive. Then you see easy to use, easy to monitor, you know, a positive sentiment, et cetera. So you see all that. And then you'll also see it at the red, at the uh, entity level as well. Again, each of these different scores has a magnitude. So that will tell you not just what the score is, but the strength of that assessment. The next thing is syntax. So we can parse a sentence to figure out the relationships between the words, whether the type of speech, whether it's plural, singular, all that kind of stuff. And then finally, uh, we can categorize the text into a common set of categories, right? So that we'll talk about when you need to do some kind of custom categorization. In this case, there are some predefined categories and you'll get back a confidence score uh, around those. So that's a natural language API. To use it, uh, I'll show you a few examples in different programming languages. You would need to do a little bit of authorization and then you would uh, pass in your document and you hear what you're doing you're using the curl command that you know, if you're familiar with Linux, you're just directly calling that REST API. And your the URL is the Google Language API URL. And then we're calling the classify doc, no, excuse me, classify text operation on that. And you'll get back some JSON that your application would parse. Let's move on to the vision API. The Vision API provides many services. I'll just name a couple of these, uh, you know, very common use cases. Um, image uh, classification, you know, you see on the top left where you're able to look at an image and uh, provide labels about what's in that image. Object detection around, uh, you know, the location of various objects in, in the image. Uh, OCR, where we're trying to extract text from the image and for some other APIs you can see here. So let's take a look at a kind of fun example here where we have um, an amusement park in Sydney here called Luna Park. And um, you see the labels coming back. So correct first and foremost, it comes back as a landmark, but you also see other key parts of the picture, uh, the sky, it's daytime, architecture, et cetera. So you just get this set of labels and those confidences coming back from the API. With OCR here, you notice that it's able to pull back uh, two words from the picture. And it even has landmark detection. So it can cross-reference with Google Maps and give you a, um, it's noticed that at 85% confidence that it's located where this picture is on the map and giving you that location. So how do you use it? Um, and I'm going to show you the REST API again. We're going to move on to how to use SDKs in a moment. But just if you're kind of looking at the structure underneath, uh, you have an API uh, endpoint here. You're making a request, and you pass in the type of information you want in your request. And then your response will have uh, the information that corresponds to all the features you're looking for in the picture. Right, whether you're getting labels back or looking for logos or all the different things you can do that will come back in the response. So let's look at how you do that in the SDK. So there's a, here a Python SDK, you import the package, then you instantiate a client, 
Uh, let's say here we point to an image located in a storage bucket somewhere. And at the end where it all happens is we take that client and we call the label detection method on it and pass in the image location. And that's that. And you're gonna get back a set of uh, labels and scores for those labels. The Video Intelligence API is very similar to the Vision API, except it's looking at video, a sequence of frames. Uh, and there's some other capabilities it can do. So things like tracking objects across those frames or speech transcription, so it can uh, you know, extract uh, text out of the audio. Here's an example in JavaScript. So we instantiate a client again, point and then locate the video file and tell it what capabilities we wanna do label detection here. And then we call the annotate video uh, method on that uh, client. So what, what comes back? So very similar to the Vision API, but because it's a video, we also get information about uh, when that label enters the video. Here we see that the dog uh, starts at three seconds and exits at five seconds, right? Some additional context. And so, you know, you can do some audio to text with the Video Intelligence API, but also the text-to-speech API will do that as well, just to mention that. All right, so we talked about pre-trained APIs. Hopefully that gives you a feel for what you can do with those. But what if you wanna do something that is custom, that isn't um, you know, a predefined category or label? Uh, let's look into that. So let's look at this first scenario. We're just you know, trying to figure out, is this a cat or not? I know all my presentations use cats or dogs. That, you know, that's how ML presentations go. Um, I could pass that into the Vision API and with 99% probability, I see that it is a cat, so great. But what if I'm asking a different question? What type of cat is this? Hmm. Well, our model doesn't, our predefined uh, model that I just told you about doesn't provide that. So uh, we'll need to create our own model for it. What would be the steps to do that? Let's walk through those. So the first step is you would need to gather and pre-process your data. So you might take enough pictures with different angles, different lighting uh, of, of the types of cats. Uh, do your best to get enough of them in a balanced set so that you have a similar number of each type. And then what you might do is split your data where you might take, say, 80% of your data as the training set, set aside 20% as test, and then build a model out of your training set leaving some data aside so that you can get an objective evaluation of the model against images it's never seen before. Okay, so let's look at building a model. Um, so here we'll just show a, a couple pieces of code here. Um, this is actually going to be a little more complicated than, you know, neural networks have to be, but because I'm showing a, a convolutional neural network. Um, this is typically used for image data, um, but, uh, you know, really it's not a lot of lines of code and there are, uh, you know, the TensorFlow hub repository, you can do things like transfer learning where you can, uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel as far as some of these models, but let's just briefly look at this. Uh, so you might import some of the TensorFlow libraries here, or packages. Then here what we're doing is we're building a model. We're using the Keras sequential API, which means that we're adding each layer of the neural network in sequence. Um, so we have a couple convolutional layers. They're essentially small matrices that uh, you know, convolve or kind of go across the image and um, extract some signal from the image. Uh, we're applying some other functions. We flatten it, we go through another layer and then we finally end up at, you see at the very bottom, uh, the num classes. So the number of types of cats, like say there's 10 that we're classifying, we're gonna end up with 10 and uh, a probability score between zero and one uh, of that, you know, predicting that type of class. And so what's gonna happen as we train this, we're just gonna keep adjusting those weights, biases until we find, um, the right parameters that are going to predict best on the training set. So to go through that training process, 
in the TensorFlow Keras framework, you would call model.fit, passenger training data, and then some other parameters, uh, how many passes through the data and things like that. Now you're ready to evaluate your model once it's been fit. You're gonna look at how it performs on the uh, test data to get some accuracy. And uh, you're ready to deploy your model. Um, so you might end up with a uh, model file and there are a couple styles here. You could deploy your model to the cloud where you could use it in a server side application, a web application or uh, something like that. Or maybe if it's a mobile application where you don't necessarily want to have that traffic to the cloud, you could deploy it on device. And then how do you take advantage of that model? You can call a method like uh, predict and pass in the images. And you know, images at the end of the day are really just um, you know, pixels, which are a matrix uh, with RGB values uh, uh, of the colors. And uh, then it, we'll go ahead and predict on that. So we've talked about uh, building the model. So let's just take a step back and look at, there's a lot more than just getting a model to 99% accuracy, or whatever you want to do. There's a lot that happens after that. I mean, what? how do you test the model? How do you connect it to uh, systems uh, that are going to use the model. Uh, you know, how do you validate data that you use coming out of the model? What about retraining your model with new information um, to create new models and versioning those models? There's just a lot to think about uh, that happens after you've done that research phase of your project and you've reached a, a good point with your model. Okay, so the AI platform uh, provides you the capability to build your models with notebooks, uh, training services, and a whole lot more, as well as you know, pipelines to connect all the steps together and make this our true production uh, deployment. And I'll briefly walk you through a few of these things. Like, so you might create a notebook server here. Here we're seeing where you're um, creating a virtual machine preloaded with your favorite library, whether that's TensorFlow, PyTorch, or something else, you pick how many, you know, if you want GPUs, the size of the machine, et cetera. And then you're able to go right into Jupyter Lab, which I'll show you in a little bit. There's also serverless training. So maybe the size of your job doesn't fit onto one virtual machine and you want to you know, run a large job. You could use a serverless infrastructure, which will distribute your training job you don't have to worry about the backend infrastructure. It will do the training and then perhaps when you're finished, put the model into a storage bucket so that you can use it in the next step of your pipeline. It also can do hyperparameter tuning. So along with your training job, you can pass in the range of parameters that you wanna search across to find the optimal parameters. So once you've trained a model, you can also host the model in the cloud. So this is where something like the prediction service comes in. This gives you an online endpoint so that uh, you can perform inference on that in the cloud. It has auto scaling capability, so it can scale up and then scale back down to zero as needed. Um, it handles all the logging and monitoring for you. And there's a variety of different options uh, in terms of AI hardware to leverage. So that sounds pretty cool. Uh, what if you're just getting started or, or you just kind of want a little bit of a fast track here? Is there a simpler way? Uh, yes, there is. Cloud Auto ML. So look at that process that I was showing you before. Where does Auto ML fit in? So you see here in this diagram where the steps in the middle, it's going to take care of it for you. So of course, you still have to identify the problem and gather the data. But beyond that point, it's going to handle everything from, you know, splitting it and the train test, building the model, you know, finding the optimal ensembling of models, all these kind of things. You know, feature engineering, um, it's going to train the model and deploy it for you as well. So you can have a rest endpoint uh, for that. And then you can just make predictions with your uh, the AutoML model. Let's look at a couple examples of that. So let's start with vision. So with AutoML Vision, you could start with creating a data set and you tell it what kind of problem you wanna solve. And you see a few examples here. Is this a single label classification where you're predicting the main label for that picture? Is it multi-label or is it object detection? 
then you might import your images. And here what you're seeing is that you might import a CSV file. That CSV file would have the uh, location of each image along with the label of the image. And it will go through that, import the images, it might take a few minutes to do that. And then you're gonna end up with the screen here where you can view your data set. And here we see the various flowers that have been imported. We can see the labels for them. And uh, you know, we can adjust some of the labels if we need to, but this just gives you uh, an overview of the data you've imported. So now with that data set, we can train our model. So here we've trained a couple models and you can see some uh, accuracy statistics on those models. You can then deploy your model where you create an endpoint to serve it to your users or export it. Okay, so let's talk about AutoML natural language. So remember before we talked about pre-trained models, we took that example with the conference, we did entity extraction sentiment analysis. Let's now see if you wanted to create your own customized version of those, how would you do that? So let's look kind of at a fun example here on Kaggle, which is a data science competition site. We have a movies uh, data set where you see 45,000 movies, 26 million ratings. Let's see what we can do with that. So say we wanted to take a movie description and uh, classify the genre of the movie. Um, so we could do something like that with AutoML. An another thing might be custom sentiment. So here, we are, um, we might have terminology for our specific problem or industry. So here we're looking at the airline industry. Maybe you uh, want to tag some of these terms, you know, waiting on the tarmac, negative, so much legroom positive. And so you're kind of looking for some of those phrases, which, you know, most likely that the, the standard sentiment analysis API will work great, but um, you can really fine tune that and create your own model if you'd like with this capability. Same thing with entity extraction. So entity extraction is going to work. Here you see an example where some of the uh, entities are more general. We say, you know, Laura is a person, she wants a consumer good, but maybe you wanted to tag those a little bit more specifically. It's a beverage, it's a restaurant, et cetera. You could do that with a custom model. How would you do that? Here's an example in the, uh, the UI where we're kind of looking at various menus and we wanna kind of take the menu and then parse out, you know, is this a food item? Is this the name of the restaurant? Is this the heading on the menu? Give it enough of these menus. Can we start to um, look at a new menu and kind of figure out what the entities are on that menu? So it's an example of a custom problem that we wanna solve. All right, the final area of AutoML I want to talk to you about today is AutoML tables. And let's look at a fun example, then we'll look at a, a business example here. Uh, so another Kaggle data uh, set is the Spotify music genre list that's got uh, plenty of uh, music uh, you know, data in it, basically. So what we want to try to do is predict the genre of the music like we did with the movies uh, based on the information in the in this database. So here you see an example row uh, from the data. And you know it's interesting that um, you know each type of music, you know when we're we're listening to something, we might have our own heuristic. like our brain is comes to a conclusion. they listen to song, you listen to a song and you say, okay, you know that's heavy metal or country or whatever. Something gave that away. you know, so here what we're doing, is we're looking at some quantitative data, you know, maybe it's the loudness, the key signature, the tempo, altogether, this data can provide us some information about that piece of music and what genre is it likely part of. So we could build a model, pass that into AutoML uh, to, to do a classification problem to figure out which genre it belongs to. Let's look at a different type of problem where we are, might wanna predict the price of an item. So imagine that we're a user and we're gonna list something for sale and we, um, we're not sure what price makes sense. You know, so we were listing a piece of clothing, uh, we put the brand, we put the size. Um, what this would do here, what we wanna do is look at historical data and then 
guess what the right price would be. Okay, so we define a target column in AutoML tables and um, we're gonna predict with that. So we actually did this in a Kaggle competition. And um, what, we, what I wanna show here is this question of, you know, how well does AutoML do? Okay, so um, if you've you know, heard of Kaggle, you're probably familiar that there's a lot of great data scientists on this platform so, and, and folks that are, that are learning, but like these competitions can last for weeks. And folks are working, you know, nights, weekends, uh, improving their models every day, moving up in the leaderboard. Okay, so what you see here is on the y-axis uh, on this particular problem, the error rate. Um, and then on the x-axis, what you're seeing is um, the leaderboard, right? So what, what this trend is showing us is that as we get closer and closer to the top of the leaderboard, our error is going down, right? We're trying to get as close to zero as we can. But what you see is it plateaus uh, at about 1,000. And so what this is telling us is that there's a certain point where the problem is, is pretty close to being solved. There's just minor variations among the data scientists approaches there. And so when we uh, applied AutoML tables to it, what we saw is that with one hour, so right, so you can constrain the search uh, to say, okay, I'm gonna give it a budget of one hour uh, or you know, eight hours or whatever it might be to, to uh, you know, perform this search for the optimal model. And you saw in one hour that it hit that plateau. And then as you were able to provide more time, uh, you could continue to kind of work down that curve. So um, this just puts it in perspective where, um, you know, how AutoML tables can, can do. So um, in summary, we saw three different kinds of cloud AI services today, APIs, platform, and AutoML. And I think we have a little bit more time. I'll do a couple quick uh, demos here um, of some other things. Um, this is using the natural language APIs. You have um, uh, you have more time. Go ahead. Go ahead. You have okay, more I have time about ten. Minutes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so here, what we're going to show you is the API. So I'm, I'll do one more, you know, uh, Kaggle. Uh, uh, competition to look at. So Kaggle has these great data sets. This is around clothing reviews, okay? So let's look at these reviews. So first thing we're gonna do is we're going to import the CSV. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna skip over, you know, what Pandas is and Jupyter Lab, just in the interest of time. Uh, I know it's an AI conference, um, but uh, so we're gonna, uh, you know, pull back the first five rows and just take a look at those. So what's in here? You see the text, you know, a review, and some other information, what category of clothing it is. Now let's apply a little filter. We want reviews that are long enough that we can make sense of them. We don't want a review with, you know, two words in it, right? So here I'm basically applying a filter to that column uh, and uh, just getting the longer reviews. And then I've already done a little bit of the cleanup, so we don't need to delete that column. So let's pick one of these reviews just as an example. I'm gonna pick the third one here. I had such high hopes for this dress. I really wanted it to work, but it was too small, you know, and it goes on here, right? So this, this is a real review. Let's do some sentiment analysis on it. So here you see where, you know, we import the uh, packages, we instantiate the client, and we're gonna call analyze sentiment on it and we'll return what that sentiment is. So let's see what happens. So we get a sentiment of negative 0.5 coming back in a magnitude of 3.5. Very cool, okay, not, not too bad. So let's, let's now think about, um, you know, if we're running this business and we're trying to look across our whole product portfolio, how do I make sense of all these reviews? Maybe I can get some insights into which clothing items are, um, are, are you know, have high customer satisfaction, which don't, where do I need to uh, fix some issues? So let's take a sampling of a hundred of these items and let's call the API for it. And let's do some analysis across multiple areas, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm calling the analyze sentiment 
and I'm appending the scores and magnitudes to my original data set and just concatenating them. So what that looks like is here, I've got the same reviews uh, in the you know categories and all that. And now you see that I have two more columns, score and magnitude. Okay, so we've got, we're showing data augmentation using machine learning to give us more knowledge about our data. Now let's look across the data set and let's do some visualization. So what I'm gonna do here is use the, um, you know, matplotlib library here to um, do some analysis. So this is a box plot. If you haven't seen this before, uh, this is a nice way to show the distribution of data. So here we have each of the categories, dresses, pants, blouses, et cetera. The line in the middle is the median, uh, the top of the box, 75th percentile, bottom 25th, and then the min and the max. So in one glance, you can see sort of the spread of the data. So, so this really can be helpful where you say, okay, well, it uh, looks like um, for swimwear, we're doing great, but, um, you know, maybe pants, uh, there might be some issues in our inner product line. So we're using sentiment analysis to um, get some more insights about our products. Uh, next is entity extraction. Uh, again, here's our text, and we would call analyze entities. And I'm just going to pull back the first five. And so you see here, what are the main words, right? We've got hopes, um, dress, you know, that salient score. You see where, which character, what index, where you can find that in the text, um, you know, things like that. So that's, that's a natural language API. All right, so I think I have a few more minutes. I'll show one more demo of AutoML, this time for tabular data. So here's the scenario. So you've got government data. Uh, the Feder uh, Fire Department of New York has this data set. I picked this because it only has a few columns, so we don't have to really understand too deeply what's happening. Uh, this, this gives us response times for how quickly uh, they responded to various incidents uh, over time. So you see a column for the month, the type of incident, was this a false alarm, a medical emergency, where in the city did it happen? How many times? And finally, what we're trying to predict the average response time. So we would go into tables here. We could import that CSV. <clears throat> I've already done this, so you know we don't have to do this today. You could pull it from BigQuery or Data Warehouse or from uh, CSV. Then once you import the data, it will give you some statistics here. So you see, you know, how many categorical variables, you know, timestamps, numeric, et cetera. Um, data quality indicators, percent missing and valid, correlation with the target even. So here's where you want to look for, you know, if you have something near zero, maybe it's not, uh, we don't know for sure, but maybe it's not, um, a, you know, a useful feature in the model. If it's near one, that might be a warning that you have some leakage where that feature is something that, um, information that you really wouldn't know prior to making the uh, prediction. So just this gives you kind of a quick glance uh, at things and you can click on any of these and see the distribution of the data and uh, more information like that. Okay, so then what you can do is just go ahead and train your model. You pick, uh, again, the, the budget that you want to put into it, uh, let's say one, and then which uh, features you want to include. You also have some advanced options if you choose around um, you know, which, you know, optimization objective, or you might call it a loss function, um, you know, depending on if you have outliers or not, uh, what you want to use for that. And it has early stopping. So if it's not making an improvement, it's not going to use up the budget. And you go ahead and uh, train your model. I'm not going to do this all today, but, you know, it would train the model. Then you would end up with one of these models showing up. It will give you some accuracy statistics. So what you're seeing here are the mean average error, nine seconds off, not, not bad in that our, um, it was about four and a half minutes or so was the average response time, uh, so, so not bad. And you can click and get more detail around things like uh, explainability. So we can look at our model and see which factors were the most important in the prediction. So here it looks like incident classification was number one. So 
you know, maybe false alarms, you know, versus medical emergencies, you know, whatever type it is makes a big difference. Then where in this city is second, and then uh, the time was the third most important prediction. And then finally, how do you use this? Um, so you've got a few different options. You have batch prediction, where you can uh, take a whole bunch of rows from a CSV or from BigQuery and run batch prediction on those. You can do online prediction, where you can you know, call through an API or here or just in the website and do a prediction. And finally, you could even export your model. So you can export it into a Docker container to use it in another application. All right, so that uh, ends my demo.